Good morning, potential graduates into the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. We shall all, I say potential, I believe our graduation is when we're there with him. Amen. Well, the Lord just said, I am with you, so there you go. (laughs) You know, he always has to one-up me, doesn't he? He is with us (laughs) in his presence, and he's with us in worship. Uh, as we uh, continue on in our teaching, it's our, uh, it's, it's my goal, if I have a goal, to uh, facilitate with the Holy Spirit revelation about what's going on around us, that we might see truth, and um, it would be nice, it's obvious to me in my life, I don't know about y'all, but, <coughs> excuse me. It's obvious to me in my life that truth is hard to find. Uh, You'd say, well, Alan, why do you say that? Well, if if you'd have followed me through school, you'd understand why I say that. (laughs) To an A student, that's not hard to understand. But to those of us that were a lesser, it makes a lot of sense. The truth is hard to find and you know, it's a lot of things are done by memory. And when we're seeking truth, we find the truth and we have memory. And then other things are done by equations. And it's through these equations that we find the, the ground between absolute truth and discovering truth. And it's through equations that sometimes we can come up with an answer, but it's the wrong answer. And it just so happens that God has us discovering truth as well as learning truth. And so there lies a little bit of our dilemma in this natural world, these natural bodies, a natural mind, and with a spirit of how does it, um, how does this happen? How do we discover truth? How do we embrace truth? Well, I can embrace truth that I know is truth, but how do I embrace truth that I don't know this truth? And that means I have to discover the equation that uh, shows me what the truth is. And when we come into this situation of the, uh, the delusional atmosphere that we're in today, it see, we can see that truth is as hard to discover sometimes as an out al- trying to figure out an algebra problem. Or to those of you that did wonderful in algebra, a ge- geometry problem. Uh, stuck with the algebra. And, uh, but we're trying to discover what is the truth and what is the line. And the reason I, uh, I couch it like this is because Uh, In the church, we talk about sin and what's not sin, but we don't talk too much about what's a truth and what's a lie. I'm not saying we don't mention it, but it's it's something to consider, what's a truth and what's a lie, and then what's sin and and what's not sin. We could say that the two intermingle, which they do. But in living in a delusional time, uh, we're on this quest to discover uh, contemporary truths, if you will allow me to use that phrase, it's, we, we got new situations today. Right. And we got new problem, complex problems that, uh, that uh, need some, some truth behind them. Uh, I'll go to an extreme, such as a uh, definition. What's the first thing that comes to your mind when I say furry? What? Furry. Furry. Fur- uh, furry. Animal, animal, uh, right? Well, uh, furries today is actually a movement of people who dress up like animals. Wow. That's what uh, furries are. It's a, um, I think that would easy, easily be said that they have an identification problem. And then so, but you know, we can say, well, that's not, but you know, now we see it's in our schools. Uh, that uh, people are identifying with animals. Uh, 
and I wanted to get into it just a little bit of, okay, how do, how do we, what's the, how do, what in the world is going on? And it's hard for me to have an opinion about something that seems so bizarre to me, I don't even understand it, much less have an opinion of what is the truth. And so as we're looking at the scriptures and this day of, uh, of trying to discover truth over a lie, I want us to begin today with that in mind as we are living in this uh, time of, as in the days of Noah and the coming of Christ. Now there again, let's keep that in mind. We're going into time periods. The time, we are living in a time period of deceptions. It's easy to say that this is not like it was in the 50s to those of us that were living in the 50s or the 60s or the 70s. You know, the, t today's uh, realities of, or non-realities in the culture that we're living in uh, has a lot of differences. Jesus gives us a sign of the times and he says this, he used it several times, and Jesus answered and said unto them, take heed that no man does what? Deceives you. So we see that this time of great deception. Now, we are living in a day of deception, but it's not like deception hasn't always been with us. Um, before we came to Christ, we uh, were obviously deceived. And um, as we're dealing in truth, truth versus a lie, um, when it comes to faith, faith is a truth that is imparted by God. The amount of faith that I have, the amount of faith that you have right now has been given to you as a gift. The Bible calls it a measure of faith. So we all operate in a measure of faith and uh, it would be best that we allowed everyone to operate in that measure of faith that they have and to appreciate it and to honor it. And um, as we're all moving and to have a greater measure of faith, but we see that faith is a gift of God. But you see, faith brings into my being a truth that did not go through an equation. It, it was an impartation of truth. It wasn't through accumulation of evidence. If I accumulate the evidence of faith uh, for salvation, uh, I don't know that there, Jesus did walk on the earth. I mean, I don't even know if Israel is even there. I've never been there. I take everybody's word for it, but I've never been there. So when you go through your absolute faith in Christ, you're taking a lot of people's words for stuff is what I'm saying. <clears throat> but for some reason, I believe this story. And y'all have heard me say it. It's like it's a ridiculous story, but I believe it. I'm, I'm not just believing it. I know it's true. Okay, what put in me? I had truth imparted to me. <clears throat> so we've got imparted truth. We call faith. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Now watch this. This is key. The evidence of things that are not seen. Not seen being a, a physical, psychological equation. Our whole court system and everything works out, out of evidence, right? <clears throat> but this faith thing, this imparted thing about truth, <clears throat> is not based off of evidence. Faith is imparted based off an individual yielding to the voice of God. So faith is an impartation. Um, I know we use statements like we're going to have people give a testimony so we can build people's faith. Well, you don't be, really build faith. You can stir faith. If you're with me, you can stir faith. Uh, we can be reminded of the faith that we do have. But faith is a gift from God. That's a truth of impartation. When we see that that's a truth of impartation, then we discover that that truth is based on a book that God has given us. And let me give you another impartation. I believe it to be the Word of God. I just call me stupid. But I believe, as much as I believe I'm born again, 
that this book is the word of God. Now, I know a lot of people want to get archaeology and get all this evidence that's trying to prove the word of God's word of God. You can't prove it. You have to have an impartation of faith to believe that this is the word of God. So for others to, that do not have the faith to believe it's the word of God, uh, you know, I just say, well, it's the truth. Whether you believe it or not, it's still the truth. But I have faith to believe it's the, it's the word of God. Now, it just so happens in my life that's proven out to be true as I've applied it and as I've used it. <clears throat> I see it's true, but nonetheless, I have faith to believe that this is the word of God. So I know there's a sudden something that's been imparted. So as we're Christians and followers of Jehovah God, we see that God's into this thing called impartation. Impartation takes you where you can't go yourself. That's what it does. It'll take you where you can't go yourself. And so there's some things about my Christian faith I've had to, I've asked God to give me the impartation of faith to, to believe that or to move in that. And uh, so, I'm not to belabor that too long. Let me get on here with it. <clears throat> now, we see that uh, we've discovered that we have this thing according to Christ. Uh, the verse that we've been doing the last couple of weeks was things according to this world. Then we got into things that were according to Christ. It was the Apostle Paul speaking to the church of Colossia. So in Colossians, he says, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead body, and ye are what? <clears throat> complete in him. Now, we've covered that for two weeks. You are complete in him is one of the greatest impartations of truth that you can receive. And I'm here to tell you we've not all received it. We're on a, perhaps a journey of receiving it. But we've yet to have the same uh, encounter with the truth that we're complete in him as we've had with the, this is the word of God or that we've been saved by the grace of God. So, but I want us to understand something. Being complete in him is the apostle Paul's revelation that he uses to stay free from this world deception. This is the phrase that he used. So we find ourselves almost could be deceived because we're not walking in the completeness that's in him. Now that, that's where the rubber hits the road right there. We think complete in him is just a good little phrase. It's a biblical phrase and that's sweet. No, it's, it's, it's more than sweet. It's of necessity that we grab hold of the truth and the revelation that we're complete in him so that we don't fall to deceptions. So that tells us that the deceptions are getting into us through our fleshly mind that is not walking in this completeness in him. What keeps us from deception is because we're complete in him. <clears throat> so the psychological game of the enemy is to wiggle into us through these parts of us that we think is not complete. Yeah. There lies a huge danger. A huge danger. Uh, I know that in, there's a lot of organizations out there that claim you need to say like an alcoholic or whatever that every time you stand up to testify, I'm, 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 not a, I'm an alcoholic and yada yada. And I get all the psychological games of that. But... Um, I'm here to tell you that the Word of God says if you're complete in Him, you're not an alcoholic. That's, right. Come on. that's, just, that's just true. Now, you might be carrying on with the activity of an alcoholic, but you're not hitting the revelation. You're not an alcoholic. That's you're not. No. I don't think Jesus has a lustful heart. I can't, I can't go there. So if I'm complete in him, Alan Smith has the opportunity given to him in his completeness not to have a lustful heart. That's good. If I do, I have not and I've yet to walk in this completeness of being in Christ. Now, there again, what here, and here's the reason this is important. When we sympathize with those who disagree with God, 
It's because hidden in our hearts, we are operating in the same sin or a sin equal to what we're sympathizing with. Do I get an amen or an old me? Do you, do you, I don't know that I can. Uh, when we... The area in my life that I am not walking in the just completeness that's in here. I, see, we need to walk into the truth that we're complete in him. So if I'm not walking in completeness, I'm having a disconnect with truth. And that disconnect with truth is the same avenue in which I will sympathize uh, and try to compromise with the sin of others. Because I'm trying to make, justify my own situation. Instead of walking in completeness, I'm trying to walk into justification uh, through a false mercy. Uh, Mercy is not something I give really, it's something God gives. And, and so what I'm walking after is completeness. And completeness in him is having the guts to walk in, in, and be challenged by truth. Now, what I'm trying to show here is the, the stealth movement of deception. The reason it's important that we deal with our own personal rebellion is to understand that's how the deception will come into you through that. Then you'll find yourselves being religious and sympathizing with things that you should not be sympathizing with. There again, we always sympathize with the sinner, but not with the sin. <clears throat> so sin is non-negotiable with us. This is non-negotiable, that's all. It's because God said that. Now, how can we be non-negotiable and still be compassionate? It's because we're walking in completeness. Completeness of Christ. Was Christ compassionate? Yes. Was was Christ also truthful? Yes. Did Christ turn over a table? Yes. Here's here's what you got to get. Repentance is based on the degree that the truth has been established. In other words, We're getting sloppy repentance because we're getting sloppy words from the pulpits. We're getting a watered down. You will not repent any higher than the message that's being taught to you. Does that make sense? You will not jump. You will not repent. How can you repent of a message that has been watered down and weakened? I submit to you, most repentance is based on the degree of what the message is that you're repenting of. So therefore, the messages must be clear, they must be truthful, they must not be watered down. I stand before you as a sinner, but I am speaking about a God and His perfect word, so in that I'll be very bold. I'll be very bold. But there again, it's not in who I am, it's in who He is. Now, So the completeness is not something to be taken lightly. I mean, how many people are always uh, condemning themselves? You know, you know, this is, you know, self condemnation. Why? Why? Why is it such a big deal? There is now therefore. Why no condemnation? Why is that a big deal? You're like, oh, oh, that's sweet. I'm so glad he said I'm not condemned. No, it's, 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 a, it's a spiritual action that must be appreciated and believed so you understand there's now therefore no condemnation. That's good. If you're in Christ Jesus, that's his completeness. So the internal dialogue must reflect completeness. You can say, well, Alan, I'd sound like I was bragging on myself. Well, try it. If you overdo it, we'll calm you down. Okay. But I, I just I cannot overemphasize because as, as we move forward in this understanding, it's got to have the backdrop of completeness in Him. And then, you see, when you get the completeness in Him, you're, you, the, I promise you, this is a promise, is we start getting our completeness. That is, a, that is, that is the 
avenue in which God imparts more faith. If you can get that. Faith is imparted by God through embracing completeness because God embraces his son. He doesn't embrace us in our sin. He embraces his son. He empowers his son. It's, it's, it's just an amazing spiritual factor. Uh, and it's, it's really sneaky on how the enemy takes believers and takes Christians and <clears throat> can reduce us to, to people on the planet that are not to be feared or dreaded by hell. And that's a shame. That's just a shame. Now, hang on to completeness. You are complete in him, and that's the truth. In Colossians 2, 9 and 10, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead. Ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Completeness does what? Completeness keeps you, and that's the truth. That is a truth in completeness. How, when we leave this body, what gets us to heaven is because of the completeness of Christ. You can't get there. You can't even help it one inch. Not one iota can you contribute <clears throat> to you being transformed into the likeness of Christ and being there uh, before him in all of his majesty. We, do not, we, we don't contribute anything. When you leave your body, you're, not, you're, you're trusting the completeness in him. Trust me. We're laying there on our bed waiting to leave this world. Uh, you will have no completeness in yourself. It'll all be in Christ. I remember when I was there and felt like I was a couple months away from death. I had but one prayer, had but one vision. And I told Jesus in my prayer, I said, Jesus, I am hanging on to you. If I go to hell, you've got to go with me because I'm not letting go of you. Now that might sound bad, but that's what I said and I prayed. I said, God, you might let go of me, but I am not letting go of you. That is the truth. I said, I am not letting go of you. Because I knew that my completeness at that moment, everything else had stopped. I was leaving this planet. I knew that my completeness was in Christ. <coughs> well, just would to God that I could hang on to that completeness today, tomorrow. Every day of my life, my completeness is in him. And as I walk in my completeness is in, in him, all of a sudden I get a little bolder. Uh, I get a little bolder. I get, it'll get a little uh, sassy in the Holy Ghost, if you will, of my completeness uh, in Christ. And as I walk in the completeness in Christ, I find that I'm not near as disappointed in myself because it's in him. Now that's the truth. Now keep that, it's very important. Watch this, I am complete in him who is the head over and rule of and authority of every angelic and earthly power. Colossians 2, 10, I am alive with Christ in Ephesians. I am free from the law of sin and death in Romans. I am far from oppression and will not live in fear according to Isaiah. I am born of God and the evil one does not touch me according to 1 John. I am holy and without blame before him in love according to Ephesians and in 1 Peter. I have the mind of Christ in Corinthians and Philippians. I have the peace of God that surpasseth all understanding in Philippians. <clears throat> the spirit of God who is greater than the enemy in this world lives in me. First John. Hallelujah. That's just hallelujah. Now, that's a lot of revelation to get. That's a lot of faith to believe that. Now, I believe it as far as my salvation, and I believe it as far as his book, and that is the book. So that means, now watch, it's the psychological disconnect. <clears throat> I can read that up there, and I can say, wow, I want to walk in that. But when I go here, I can say, well, I believe that. I believe this is the word of God. I believe this is the truth. When I, when I segment it out and put it up there, it's like, oh boy, I want to reach for that. Psychological disconnect. I already believe that because I took it out of here. And I have the faith 100% to believe this is the word of God. I believe it. <clears throat> so it's a battle 
of the words of Alan's mind versus the word of God. There lies the battle. It's the same battle of the words of God and the words of Alan. In my spirit, I already believe it. But yet my soul, my old man, shouts forevermore. Could my problem be that I've yet to bring into subjection my soul under the authority of my spirit, man? I submit to you that. Now let's watch this. Now we got deception versus and delusion. Two terms, words in the Bible. <clears throat> deception, delusion. Deception is what the evil one's gonna be doing. Uh, delusion's what God sends. You, know, you say, well, Alan, it's about the same thing. Well, yaddy, 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 no. Now watch this, 2 Thessalonians. For this cause, God shall send them strong delusion <clears throat> that they should believe a lie. Now, when I take that out of context of what's going on, when this, what this is talking about, that seems like a pretty insensitive statement by God. Uh, it almost seems like it goes against God's character. Two things happen is we need to keep it in the context in which it's used. And the second thing is we're just not that familiar with God's character. Now, <clears throat> deception is the act to deceive through some type of evidence. That's the way deception works. I'm gonna give you this evidence, I'm gonna give you that. <clears throat> so I'm gonna accumulate this evidence to equal, there's the equation of the world, I'm gonna give an equation that will equal a non-truth that I don't know what it is. So therefore I've got 10 pieces of evidence. So therefore it's pointing to this truth. So therefore that must be true. I mean, you know, it's, I think it's a pretty good way for man to do it because that's all man's got going for him, right? We try to come up with these equations. The only thing I can tell you is that equation will not always point you to the truth. So when it comes to the Word of God and with God, for some reason I want to accumulate evidence to prove that it's God and it's true before I believe it. You ain't going to get it. The faith to believe the Word of God truth doesn't come that way. The, the faith to believe the word of God is impartation. To believe something that you're accumulating. We can get the accumulation of evidence on Kelly Watson right now. My friend Jeff Rowland right now. Uh, all kinds of everybody. I've had cancer. Everybody that's been through cancer or any other heart disease or whatever. The evidence will point to a something. And we're all looking for the good report. But for some reason, we got the report of the Lord. And I just promise you, it's like God waits till the last minute. You got all the evidence you need. And God says, your army's too big. Cut her down a little bit. <laughs> right? I mean, that's, this is God's way. It, it, it's, it's God's way. It's like it's in... He, makes, he gets a situation that's totally impossible. The greatest impossibility was for you to be born again, right. to be a sinner, totally against God, and you're sitting here in the days, these days of your life, you're sitting here because God converted your heart. I mean, for all eternity you've been changed. Right. You hadn't been changed for here. You've been changed for all eternity. The old you just say bye-bye, right? But yet we hang on to it. <clears throat> now let's watch this. That's a deception. A delusion <clears throat> is a type of false faith. Now watch this. No evidence that is being experienced, but it is, it is being experienced through a mental illness. That's what a delusion is. Now, people don't want to call it what it is, but it's a mental illness. I mean, it's a mental disorder. It means you ain't thinking right. That's what it means. It's what a mental illness is. You're not thinking right. But I submit to you, which I have before, 
Sin is mental illness. I hope I hurt your feelings. But I just told you the truth if you've ever heard it in your life. Sin is mental illness. You ain't thinking right. So God gives his word and his truth to help us with our mental illness. Now, if sin is mental illness, see something happens with a delusion. A delusion is a type of false faith. In other words, you got faith in something that's not true. That's what a delusion is. Uh, go back to my uh, furry friends. It's delusional. It's, it's, it's a mental disorder. Years ago, you called it a type of a dysmorphia, you know, uh, just like with anorexia or whatever. <clears throat> anorexia, you, the person who has it can look in the mirror and they're weighing uh, 70 pounds and they see a 400 pound person. You say, well, Alan, how can they see that? It's cause it's delusional. Um, I've talked a good bit to a person who had anorexia. And uh, this day and time, they're following God, running with God, 100% wide open with God. And I can ask this person, have done it in the, in the last month or two, well, who do you see in the, in the mirror? They're still 400 pounds. That individual had to take the truth of God over what they were seeing. Wow, that's good. Can anybody get what depth of faith that is? You can't trust your own eyes at what you're seeing. It's a type of dysmorphia is what that is. Well, it was when my mother with mental illness used to put you in a mental hospital she was in Broughton, Morganton. A lot of you, perhaps if you're old enough, knew about that years ago. And so if you had if you had some mental disorder, some of them real bad, you'd be put into what we call a mental hospital. Then it came out with all these drugs, and all of a sudden everybody said, we're going to turn the mental hospitals open. We don't need them anymore. We got all these drugs uh, to, to deal with mental illness. And then you ended up with homeless people all over all your cities. 75% of them got mental illness. Why? Because it turned, we don't have a place for them to go like we used to have. You can say, well, mental hospitals were terrible. Well, it was terrible things there for sure, but it was still better than being homeless. And I've been in and out of more than anybody in this room, I promise you. And, they, and is it, is it kind of tough in a mental hospital back in those days? It was kind of tough, but uh, the whole situation was tough. It's not like you're going to make it into a Disneyland. But what happened then, we got into a situation, we're going to turn all the mental disorders and mental illness, we're going to turn it loose, give everybody a bunch of dope because we can control it. We have now elevated ourselves to this place. We can now control everything with drugs only to make the situations worse. Today, we've got people with mental disorders and illnesses running our country. We've made it all acceptable behavior to the point you can have a mental disorder of a, of a, of a furry, and I believe it or not, it's, a, and it's sad. See, some people have to, re, they have to escape into this, uh, this other persona because they have fear just to talk to you. So they can walk around with a headset on or with the ears or whatever looking like they're an animal, and they kind of hide behind that so therefore they can go out in public. Is that not sad? So we have it in our schools today and we're all against that. Oh, what's the world coming to? Well, you got to understand, it doesn't make sense. But if you look at it, it'll make, you got to look into it, not at it. And you've got a dysmorphia going on. You've got mental illness going on. To the point it looks crazy to us, those of us that don't have that particular mental illness. I chose my words carefully. <clears throat> So therefore, when we're in the sin that we're in, that's the reason I say that's where the deception comes in. When we're in the sin that we're in, it just so happens we are somewhat sympathetic to those with the same sin. That's mental illness. That's disagreeing with God. Disagreeing with God is not thinking properly. That's what mental illness is. 
And there again, I submit to you, we got all of this mental illness going on. <clears throat> and in the church, if God doesn't get, our, get us into the deliverance business, I don't know what we're going to do. Because a lot of this is going to have to come through impartation and just divine intervention. You're not going to be able to counsel all this stuff. We're going to have to have an anointing from God. That God will give us this anointing that this mental illness can be cured. There again, please do not categorize mental illness as somebody that has a mental disorder that's different than yours. Please hear me. That's, I just told you the truth. Anything you got that you're thinking in your mind and in your world that does not agree with God's truth, which comes through impartation of truth, you believe it because God said it, not because you got some great, grandiose idea that you're so blame smart, you can accumulate enough evidence to equal a psychological truth and spiritual truth here. Because I've arrived and I'm the cat's meow. Uh-oh, that was a fury comment. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Lord, I get the nudge. Delusion is a type of false faith. Now, <clears throat> you got to understand, if it's a false faith, no evidence. <clears throat> when you start psychologically getting these ideas, oh, I know what they're thinking about me. I've got this great gift of spiritual discernment. And I can hear, I know what they're thinking. They're all looking at me. That's a mental illness called paranoia. You get it also when you do a lot of drugs. First thing you do is you think everybody's watching you take the drugs, right? That's the way sin is. It's, it, it creates this paranoia and we start trying to develop. It's a false faith in something that's not true. I'm just telling you the ways this deception comes into our hearts, into our lives. It's much more stealth than you think and we got more of it than you think, than you know. Now, <clears throat> maybe I'm giving you too much information. Second Timothy says, for God hath not given us a spirit of fear. So how, how do I know I'm walking delusional? It produces fear. But of what? Power and of love and of what? A sound mind. The truth of God is what gives us a sound mind. Now, I hope that I'm shaking you a little bit that there's more disorders out here now than you can shake a stick at. Who's OCD? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> Compulsive disorders, don't raise your hand. Right? <clears throat> I'm not saying we're going to get set free of all of them. I, I, I'm not going to say that. It's just like this, uh, a person I'm talking about with uh, anorexia. They look in the mirror, they still see a 400 pound person. But this person has learned through the power of God not to use that as a truth. That's awesome. Is that not awesome? That's good. We can say, well, God deliver that person of seeing a 400 pound person. Well, what's greater? Erasing the 400 pound person or lining up with what God says about this person and that's not it. That's good. It just, I'm, I'm, I'm just amazed. God did not change the imagery. He changed the heart. And the imagery doesn't make any difference. That's a wow. So if the imagery doesn't make any difference to an anorexia, but yet they're walking with God because they're walking in the truth of God, how much more should we do that in everything we do in life? What if God doesn't change the imagery around you of what you're seeing? What if God doesn't change the imagery? God can change your heart to deal with that imagery. If what you're saying is truth, I don't know if it's truth or not. I don't know if it's a delusion or an illusion or I don't know what it is. But I do know this. God can change our hearts to deal with whatever delusions, illusions that we're seeing. So when I see the world and it's in a chaotic state and it's like it's all to hell in a handbag, If I'm not careful, that is delusional to me because I know that God's the God over all of it. Amen. As they say, I've read the end of the book. I can't become delusional by the accumulation of the evidence that everything's going to hell in a handbag. 
I don't know how much of it's real and how much of it's delusional. I don't know because I'm living in the day of the great delusion. So I don't know. You don't know which report, which YouTube to believe, which report on TV. Oh, this, oh, this one thinks like me, so therefore I'm going with this crowd. Well, why did, uh, what about, does anybody here with the plea of my heart, somebody? I'm pleading that there's three sides. There's your side, there's my side. There's a right and there's the left and there's God's side. And I'm just telling you, all of them stink but God's. You can try to make one of them virtuous and you're delusional. And that's the truth. Now, Strong delusion, we get into the scripture. Definition, delusion, illusion, hallucination. So I ain't never had one of that. Eh, be careful. Mirage meaning something that is believed to be true or real, but that is actually false or unreal. That's what it is, strong delusion. It's actually false or it's unreal. We're living in a day that the enemy, the spiritual world, is trying to totally, I'm not saying things are bad or worse. I think they're worse than they used to be. I do. But I'm not going to be delusional in that that equals something. Now, watch this. Delusion implies or an inability to distinguish between what is real, what only seems to be real, often as a result of a disordered state of mind or mental illness. There you go. That's what it is. Now, as Christians, if I could persuade you of anything, I know you, I, I do ask you to test it, but if I could persuade you of anything, if you start seeing sin as mental illness, it'll, it'll scare the bejeebies out of you. That's right. Well, if it wasn't mental illness, why do you feel like you got to hide it? If it's not sin, why do we feel like we got to hide it? You know, I, mean, I call it the fig leaf effect, Right? If it's in, you got to hide. you got to cover it. Now, let's move on quickly. I've taken way too much time here. For they reject the truth and prefer lies. It says this in 2 Timothy. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having each in ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and the truth, and shall be turned into fables. Now, the great deception is the consequence of people who refuse to believe truth. Now, there's one thing to be delusional, but you've got to understand the first stage of being delusional is rejecting truth. All right? It's progressive. So we want to be careful and not, in other words, we know what, as Christians, we know what the Word of God says. We know what the truth is. The only thing, the only warning I give you is don't water down the truth of God. Don't touch it. Don't touch it. Did I say don't touch it? Don't touch it. don't touch it. Lest you become delusional. Some people like some translations that I detest because I think they're delusional. And that's right, I do. I've said it and you can call me crazy. Now, 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 through 12. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth. You see that? That's first. First thing that happens, and I'm sorry I won't be able to get to it today, but you've got to see the progression of this thing. Blow you out of the water. Um, and for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. What happens first? They reject the love of the truth. You see that? Don't forget that. Because you reject the love of the truth, there's a consequence. The consequence is for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion. In other words, you won't have a sound mind, and if you don't have a sound mind, you're delusional. There you go. That they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So here we start mixing something. You do not have the love for the truth, and then you mix it with the love of unrighteousness. Now, when you're in sin, you'll love the unrighteousness of the sin. 
So the first place we repent is the love of the sin that we're doing. When we repent of the love of the sin and ask God to forgive us of the sin, then it is only then that the delusion is lifted. Only then. Now let's move on quickly. God's delusion is when he gives you what you want. Here you are. You can say, well, God's a mean God. Why did God do that? God shouldn't have done that to me. That's not what, God ha that's not what happens here. God gives you what you want or what you think you want. He says this, delusion is a consequence of rejecting truth, always. So my question to you is how long have you been dealing with a particular sin or a particular truth? Why not be sin? It can be a truth that you're not acting upon. How long have you and God been having a discussion on the same thing? It needs to be handled quickly. The truth sets us free and keeps us from delusion. Delusion being mental illness. After people have refused the truth for so long, God will allow them to have what they desire. That's so scary. Now here we're going to begin uh, next week where we see a similar pattern in Romans chapter one. I'm sure you all know this chapter uh, we'll get into it uh, a little bit. We're going to read the whole thing, then I've got to get you where I want you to go. I leave the heat. Uh, I kind of somewhat hate to leave you delusional at this point. Uh, I don't want to do that. <clears throat> but I hope, and uh, you test what I say, but I'm not sure that we're taken to the depths of the consequences of sin. Uh, and in this day and hour that we're living in, it has a greater consequence of being delusional and we're asking God, God, show us the truth. Who should I? God, I just need the truth, God. And uh, so that is the, to answer that question is what we're trying to do. So let's stand. Lord Jesus, we love you and we thank you for your word. I ask and pray, Lord God, if there's anything that I've said that's not of you, that it would fall to the ground. If anything that I've said is of you, oh God, I pray that you give us a revelation of your truth. I pray, oh God, that you would forgive us all of sin. You forgive us all, oh God, where we're delusional. And I pray that your truth will be supreme in our hearts and our minds. Forgive us, oh God. Forgive us, oh God, of our unrighteousness. Forgive us, oh God, for not aligning with your truth. Give us more revelation of your truth that we might align with, that we might repent and we might align with your truth, that we might truly be a feared army upon this earth to the presence of evil that we might swing a big ax of your word and it become real in the faces of our adversary that they too might be converted set on the straight and narrow way of the kingdom of God and God's people said amen and amen thank you